Hi, I'm Mike Bellevue, and today we're back in the shop. And our topic is going to be this beautiful Pedersoli replica of a Whitworth rifle. Now, this is a gun that's been on my wish list for quite a while. Um, and I just couldn't find any uh, for several years. And if you're in the same boat, at least as of when this was made, which would be in the, uh, the summer of 2022, Dixie Gunworks has them in stock. And I ordered one from Dixie, and I ordered it just like you, paid full price, didn't ask for a T&E, because I knew I really wanted to play around with this baby. Uh, I get asked by quite a few viewers to do more stuff with rifled muskets, uh, basically more Civil War stuff. And I was never really a rifled musket guy. I mean, I've always been more of a, for rifles, a flintlock guy. But I have to admit, my interest has been peaked. As you know, over the last year, I did quite a bit with an 1859 Sharps uh, paper cartridge gun, which I absolutely loved. And since that was a Union sharpshooter's gun, I got interested in what the Confederate sharpshooters were using. And of course, the premier Confederate sharpshooter's rifle was this Whitworth from Britain. And these guns were the brainchild of Sir Joseph Whitworth. And he was, uh, he was an artillery designer, actually, and he was asked by the British military to design an accurate, long-range rifle for use by the Army. And he put his considerable brain power to that, and he came up with this gun. And this Pedestoli replica is quite lovely. Uh, in, in fact, I would say it is the most beautiful military replica that Pedersoli makes. And, and that's a good thing because it costs a lot of money. Uh, I don't want to quote a price because the way inflation is going, I might get your hopes up <laughs> with a price that I think is ridiculously high. Uh, might seem pretty reasonable by the time you see this video. I don't know. But... but um, but these guns are expensive. They've always been expensive, and as, as money becomes more worthless, they're more expensive. So I was happy to pick one up. And I also, at the same time, picked up a hexagonal um, Whitworth bullet mold, Pedersoli's, that Dixie also carried, and, and I bought the handles for it. Now, the, the thing about these Whitworth rifles is that the bore is not round uh, with cut rifling, as, as most guns would be. The gun barrel itself, the bore, is hexagonal. It's a twisted hexagon, right? It twists with a pitch of one turn in 20 inches, um, which, you know, Sir, Sir Joseph decided was what was needed to stabilize a long bullet and, and he decided that three times the length over the width of the bullet is the best ratio for long-range shooting. Uh, consequently the the British government wanted a bullet that weighed the same as the 577 bullet used in their Enfield, the, the, uh, basically the mini ball used in their Enfield, which was 530 grains. So Whitworth decided that the proper caliber for the most accurate long-range rifle with a 530 grain bullet was going to be 0.451, that that was going to give that right length ratio to the diameter, right? Uh, so that's why this is a 45 caliber gun. Now, one of the reasons I was interested in Whitworth is because I knew it was going to make me learn a lot of things I didn't already know. And, and that was one of the good things about the paper sharps as well. So when I bought the gun, I didn't know as much as I do now. And if I did, I might not have bought that hexagonal bullet mold. Because I have been told by people who have shot these more than I have, because this has not gone to the range yet, uh, that the hexagonal molds are problematic. That the twist of the bullet itself doesn't always match the twist of the bore and that the best hexagonal bullets are made by swaging a bullet in a cut-off section of Whitworth rifle barrel. Um, 
which is not happening here. So, so the bullet mold is quite expensive. The hexagonal mold, it's it's hundred and eighty dollars, and the handles are another fifty. And I probably would have saved that money if I knew what I did now, but but maybe not because it's going to make a good experiment. So there are a number of things you have to do before you can actually shoot a Whitworth rifle because it loads quite differently from conventional, um, let's say, mini ball type rifled muskets because it's not a rifled musket. It, it uses typically a solid based projectile if you're using the hexagonal slug. Uh, or there are hollow base cylindrical slugs as well. I'm going to talk about the bullets in a minute. But uh, before you even get to the bullet, of course, you've got to have powder. And I'm using 1.5 FG Swiss. And I'll talk about how I measure that in just a minute. Uh, but on top of the powder and the bullet, you need to have a series of wads with the Whitworth. You know, just load the bullet on top of the powder. So you need tools to make those. You need a punch, uh, which I'll be showing you in a minute. And you need to punch out wads and cards and a whole variety of things. So I'm going to take you through that. Then the bullets themselves have to be paper patched. Uh, and that was a new skill for me. Um, and then there are some accessories that uh, that go with the Whitworth rifle that I thought were good to pick up. So before you ever go out to the range, you actually have a ton of stuff to do. And I'm going to take you through that in this video so that when you get your Whitworth, you know all the things you have to have to go with it to be able to go shoot it for the first time. So let's let's get to it and show you what it takes. Okay, so I'm gonna try something a little bit different here. Uh, I've taken a camera and I've mounted it on a small tripod right on my workbench, which means we can't jostle it around too much, but uh, I'm doing it because, you know, I get comments sometimes that you can't see the work I'm doing when I'm shooting kind of down over my shoulder or reaching around things. So I thought for some things maybe this would work out. So we're going to give it a try. So there are a lot of things you have to make or do before you can shoot a Whitworth rifle because the bore is hexagonal. And one of the first things that you have to do is you have to make, I'm going to get, <laughs> I'm taking out the patches here. You have to make a hexagonal cleaning jag. So I don't know how well you can see this. I'm gonna try to get try to get that focused in. You can do that. So that's a 50 caliber jag that I filed into a hexagonal shape. And then I recut the grooves to hold on to the patches. And you need to do that because obviously a round jag won't get into the corners of the rifling in that hexagonal bore. So, I made this, and I've got a supply of patches that I cut, and that's the first thing you got to do. Now, if you want to shoot the Whitworth rifle with its hexagonal bore. It has kind of a different way of loading. And it loads with wads over the powder. So, first you would have a card wad. And I don't know how well you can see it, but try to, that is a hexagonal card. And this is a hexagonal felt wad. Now these are going to get soaked in lube. They are not soaked yet. These come from Petersoli, these wads, so I'm going to punch them out in the future <clears throat> out of felt. Uh, my own felt. <clears throat> but I bought a supply from Petersoli. They come with a card stuck to the back of them, but I will probably still load one of these. These are cut from a milk carton with this punch. 
It's a hexagonal punch. It's made by a fellow named Peter Dyson in England, which he makes a lot of stuff for Whitworth. Whitworth stuff is not easy to find. Okay, so you put in powder, one of these hard wads, a greased felt wad, and then you would seat the bullet on top of that. Which brings us to the subject of bullets. I'm going to be trying three different types of bullets. This will be the first one. This is actually a hexagonal bullet. All right, hopefully this is going to work out. I'm trying something just a little bit different here. Um, because I've been criticized in the past um, for the tabletop stuff. Uh, because the camera's looking down this way and sometimes you can't see because my big hands get in the way. And whenever I get criticized, I, I always evaluate, and believe me, I, I read all of your comments. Uh, I can't always answer them all, I'm afraid, but I do try to read them all. And whenever I get criticized, I ask myself, uh, does that critique hold water? And if it doesn't, I just let it go. Uh, but if I think it does, then I ask myself the next question. What could I do to improve that? And sometimes that's easy, and sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's a real technical issue that I just don't have sufficient command of the medium, I guess, or equipment to be able to deal with. So the, the tabletop stuff, you know, a lot of people say, well, can't you put a camera on the other side, or can't you build... <laughs> you know, some sort of framework to hang a camera from your ceiling, which I guess I could, but that's kind of out, I gotta admit. Uh, but putting a camera on the other side is always difficult because you need a tripod, and they're generally gigantic affairs, um, or they're not stable. But it just so happens that my last compact camera, the one I use for most 18th century events, uh, broke at Fort Loudon which is why you don't see anything from the last day on that video. Uh, because I was filming the ceremony at night and I dropped it and broke the lens and there she went, right? So I got another camera, compact, that actually has more capabilities. And that's what I'm using right now. And, and it came with a pretty neat little compact tripod that seems sturdy enough to do the job. We're gonna see. So that means that I can put it on the other side of the table for me and show you what I'm going to do. So we're going to hope that this will work. Okay, now basically I have two bullets. I have to paper patch. All right, we've got the, uh, the hexagonal bullet from the Pedersoli mole. All right, I don't see already I'm having trouble with this. Let's see if I can do that. Yeah, cheat the autofocus there. And I've got the British cup base bullet, which is the British mill spec. Both of these have to be paper patched to work. And in order to do the hexagonal bullet, I got a template from Buffalo Arms for 45. But this bullet being cup based means I have to kind of make a tail and push it in, so I had to make a larger template myself, which is that. Okay, we're going to start with the hexagonal bullet. Let's try to get a little more light on the situation here. Alright, so I've got my, my shorter piece of paper from my Buffalo Arms template. I'm just gonna dunk it in the water. I don't want it to be sloppy. I just want it to be wet. I'm gonna take the bullet. I'm gonna try to line it up as straight as I can with the top edge of the paper. I'm gonna fold this over. And I'm gonna roll it up tight. I don't wanna pull on it because I don't wanna rip the paper. Okay, so I've got it sealed down. And now I'm just going to tuck the ends over like that. 
because it's a flat base bullet. Okay, so there we go. We are paper patched. That's going to dry. As it dries, it's going to shrink down. That's going to be fine. Okay, so now I've got the mil spec bullet. So I'm going to take the larger piece of paper. I'm going to dip that. so high okay now once again I'm going to try to be as straight as possible on this now this is a little bit different because what I want to do I actually rip the bottom a little bit Okay, is, is tuck it up underneath. And that's going to dry. And you can see the way these two look. Now, I don't have any of the mil spec ones dry yet because I just started doing those. But let me pull out one of the others if I can get it started. Bop, 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 bop. All right, so when they dry, they look like that, right? So we got the two wet ones and the dry one, right? And that's how they go. All right, just to give you a little bit of a clearer view, here are the three bullets involved. Uh, to the left is the hexagonal bullet from the Pedersoli mold. In the center is the RCBS, basically 4570. 500 grain bullet uh, that I'm loading. And then to the right is the mil spec Whitworth bullet that came from uh, papercartridges.com, uh, which is Brett Gibbons' outfit in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. So here's what they look like paper wrapped. Uh, here is the, the um, hexagonal bullet. And here is what the mil spec bullet looks like. And then, of course, the 4570 bullet is not going to be paper patched. I mean, I could, but I have to size it way down. Uh, but instead, that's going to be sized to 451, and it's going to be lubed. So it's going to be run through a lubricizer. And that makes all the difference with those bullets. And Brett packages his mil spec bullets in uh, a replica of actual 19th century packaging, which is, I think, just kind of a cool touch, especially if you're putting together an outfit where you're going to have all of the accessories displayed. So that's the story on bullets. I'm going to try all three of these at the range and see which one shoots the best for me at 100 yards. And then I'll take that one and try it on something a little more challenging. So that's all about bullets. We already talked about wads. You've got to punch out hexagonal wads, right? And have those soaked in, in grease, which these are. I use a lamb's tallow and beeswax mixture uh, on them. And so now we've got bullets and wads. And it's time to talk about propellant. Well, we discussed bullets. Now we need to power those bullets to the target. And to do that, I'm using 1.5 FG Swiss, and I'm shooting a 75 grain load. And, and here are some individual loads. And because this is a precision target gun, what I'm doing is I'm actually weighing each load, and I'm putting each one in its own little test tube. So here's, here's how I do that. I've got a measure. I've got it set for somewhat less than 75 grains. We'll see how much in a second because I've been diddling with it. So I'm gonna put that on the scale. All right, so we're at 73.5. Now, I've got this Redding powder dribbler and I'm going to trickle powder trickler. I'm going to trickle in powder. I get it. 
Okay, so now I'm over 74 grains. And typically I would get this a little bit closer. I would keep playing with my main measure until I'm thrown within about a half a grain, but just for illustrative purposes, I'm at 74.5, 6, 7, 8. All right, now we go slow. 9. Seventy-five. All right, so it's exactly a seventy-five grain charge, and I can decant it into its own little charge tube. And I have a whole bag of those, so I'm going to fill them up. So here we are, I've got 50 individual powder charges loaded up and ready to go to the range. And that should give me all the shooting I can stand for one day. All right, the next thing I'm gonna be dealing with is the nipple. And that's because I'm using these Schutzen brand, just like that on the front, musket caps. And unfortunately, these are a little bit of a problem. Now, if you've got good RWS caps, use those. The problem with these is they're a tight fit, so are RWS caps. The difference is these, though they look like they're made of copper or brass, are actually made of steel. And they do not open up the way the copper ones do to fit on here. And because of that, they cushion the blow of the hammer and the caps don't go off all the time. And that is not good. All right, so what we're going to do is I'm going to reduce the diameter of the nipple just a little bit. And then I'll be able to get the caps on and off easily. And they should go off every time. Now I learned this on my Sharps rifle where I use the same caps and have the same problems. So I'm going to go around and I'm going to file this I'm just going to take a little bit off. Now, I'm going to use 80 grit, then 120 grit, and eventually I'll get it down to 400 grit sandpaper and So I'm just going to keep shoe shining this, just like this, all around it, so that I keep, I maintain my circular shape. And I'm going to do that until I've got a good fitting cap. Okay, so we've got this all polished up. And the caps go on and off the nipple very well. And I'm just going to leave this in the white, I think. I'm not going to re-blue it. So that's all good to go. All right, these last two items are really kind of optional items, but uh, they're handy to have, particularly this one. This is a snap cap. It's a, a leather cover, basically, that mounts over your nipple. And it allows you to dry fire the gun without damaging the nipple. And that was an important aspect of uh, British marksmanship training in the military. It was called the positional drill, where a soldier could heft the gun, get used to using the sights and pulling the trigger, uh, all without using powder or ball or damaging anything. So I got the snap cap and this final item from a place called blockaderunner.com. And this item is billed as an Enfield musket tool. 
Uh, it's a nipple wrench and screwdrivers, uh, all built into one. It's very cool. So since I was getting the snap cap, I thought, well, I'll get that. Uh, because I said this is the Enfield tool and was also used on the Whitworth. Um, in point of fact, it did not quite fit as a nipple wrench. You could use it, but it was very tight. So I ended up filing uh, the mouth a little bit bigger to fit perfectly on it, uh, which, which is no big deal. Now, the interesting thing about this tool is uh, I've seen it listed in various places as an Enfield tool, as a Springfield rifled musket tool. Um, in point of fact, it is not a rifled musket tool at all. And subsequent research has turned up that this is actually a tool for the 1870 Springfield trapdoor rifle in 50-70 caliber. And what it is is a spring vise. Uh, for removing the mainspring. So you would cock the hammer back to compress the mainspring. You would put this tool over it to keep it compressed and then take it off the gun and, you know, you could, you could work with the lock then. So that's what this really is. But now that I've opened it up to the right diameter, it does work as a fine nipple wrench. And actually, I think it's better than the T-wrench. So I guess I'm going to stick to the original story. But, but just so you know... When people tell you that this is a rifled musket tool or an Enfield tool or a Springfield tool uh, for the your rifled musket, don't believe them. That is absolutely not true. It's a it's a tool for a cartridge gun. All right, so that's what it takes to get one of these babies out and shoot it. So now I'm all ready to take this out. I've I've got my bullets, got my powder. Got my wads, caps, have everything I need. So the next time you see this thing, you'll be seeing it at the range. So until next week, bye.